Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Another episode of the Higher Line Podcast with my all the time friend, uh, oftentimes coach and sometimes student, thought of that while I was taking a nap, Dan Hart. And we're down in Costa Rica uh, for some jujitsu, and we'll be back here, what, in December, which yep. we'll talk about for your up. Is that sold? Uh, we have a couple spots left, three, I think. All right, so Dan's got a camp down here, which we'll tell you about in this podcast. But we wanted to talk about, uh, well, I wanted to talk with him about some things that I think might be valuable to you, uh, your life, and maybe you'll just find it interesting. So uh, why don't we start with this? We've had him on before, so you're a... Uh, a business guy, jujitsu gym owner. Like, if somebody said, "Who are you?" What would you say? So people always ask, and it's like an American thing to meet someone and be like, "So what do you do?" What do you do? Yeah, what do you do? <clears throat> um, usually, I just say I work in hospitality, or if I'm, depending on how I feel, I might just say whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah, whatever it takes. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a weird thing. It people, is a weird thing. <laughs> and I do it. I ask people that. Yeah, you what, know, do you do? what do you do? It's like an instant <clears throat> identification to somebody where you can be like, oh, my uncle's one of those. Well, and I've read some stuff, too, where people are like, well, <clears throat> people ask that so they can gauge, like, how much respect to give you or whether or not, Ooh. like, they give a fuck about you're you. You're a plumber. And, you're a doctor. Yeah, yeah. And I don't feel that way. I don't ever ask for that. I'm just curious always what someone does because sometimes, you know, I've worked in hospitality, so I'm in bars a lot, and that's not why I'm in bars a lot. <laughs> 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 but... You know, you ask somebody, what do you do? And, like, sometimes people are like the guy at the camp. Uh, my coach, Henry Aikens, has a camp. We met a guy there that helps program AI. That's super interesting. Yeah, he was super sharp about it. So what, so what do you do? I don't know. Who, um, are, who are you? So take your job out of the equation. Who, who are you? Yeah, so that's fair. Um, I am just looking for the next thing, I think, always. Um, you know, more stuff to do, more fun to do. You know, I've talked a lot and we've had conversations with our friend groups about things like retirement and what that looks like. I don't think that's something I'm interested in in the traditional sense. Mm. Um, so who am I? Uh, you know, always looking for fun and adventure, I guess. Looking to leave a legacy in some way. What's fun and adventure to you? Shifts from time to time. Uh, you know, being out here is a lot of fun. Doing jujitsu, hanging out with my friends, uh, forming relationships, you know, continuing on those, helping people being able to give back at this point, you know, um, I've had some success in life. And so being able to be a part of something like Hero where we can raise lots of money and help kids and give them some advantages that, you know, certainly we had from compared to their upbringing to ours mm. and try to, uh, you know, give them a stepping stone or ladder up. Real quick, good segue. So what, what is Hero? So Hero is a uh, U.S. based charity 501c3, c I don't know how that works, but, yeah, right. um, you know, but it exists in Tamarindo, Costa Rica, where we are now, run by our mutual friend, Ron Jarman. So they do these various camps in order to raise money so that they can teach the local kids jujitsu, but it's a lot bigger than that. They bust the kids from school to the jiu-jitsu academy, train them in jiu-jitsu, uh, teach them leadership skills, all kinds of stuff, and then get them rides home too, so they're not home alone while their parents are at work all day. They also um, provide school supplies, backpacks, all kinds of stuff like that. And during COVID, they fed um, like 200,000 meals to the local people. It's crazy. Yeah. When I mean, you think about how many, because this whole area is tourism, so people couldn't come down here, so then there's no income, so they need, couldn't buy food. Yeah, and, you know, we see primarily the tourist area, and we're staying at a house that has staff, but if that staff can't get paid for cleaning this place because no one's renting it, they can't buy groceries. Right, yeah. It's crazy how finely balanced a little system that is, like one little thing, like a worldwide pandemic where you're not allowed to travel could throw everything out of whack. Yeah. So we're both wearing clothes from uh, that's a... Uh, you got the... Cobb's Cob White. It's one of the brewery. beers. Yeah, it's a beer that uh, Black and Gray Brewery down in East Dundee brews for my locations. It's a wit beer. And you're wearing a Whiskey Diablo shirt, which is a uh, new concept under construction in McHenry, Illinois. It'll be a cool uh, cantina Americana, we're calling it, kind of a Tex-Mex fusion deal. So you're a restaurateur. Yeah. One you, of the things I do. You haven't said that yet. So you, when I first met you, you were tending bar and... I think maybe you were part owner of that joint at the time. I don't remember. Yeah, public house. Um, I moved out there as a um, 
manager. That's how I ended up in Woodstock. I ended up being a 10% minority shareholder for a couple of years, left to try to get out of the business, started doing uh, prefabricated rubber sports flooring, the sales and distribution of that with another friend of mine, Mark Bizek, had a very small part of that company. And I ended up actually from Mark buying DC Cobbs, um, which at that time, as you remember, a lot of people don't, 2008, was a bar that opened at 3 p.m., didn't serve any food, had a kitchen. Uh, and he gave me an extremely fair deal as a friend and wanted to get out of the business. And from there, we built that into more locations and concepts and currently have six locations with various concepts with two places. Yeah, they're not just all the same. Yeah, two places under construction, so it'll be eight. So we have the DC Cobbs concept, Hart's Garage, Hart's Saloon, um, Clausen's, which I have a couple partners in, I'm not actively involved in running, and then Hub Market, uh, which I own a like 15% of. It's a butcher shop that I have nothing to do with running it. I'm purely a on the investment side. And then this new joint. Yeah, that one's opening up, Whiskey Diablo. So margaritas, fresh cocktails, um, you know, traditional Mexican food with kind of some American twists and stuff on it. And so here's kind of one of the things I wanted to talk about. So like people chase, me and you are about the same age. I'm a few years older than you. Guys chase, chase, chase. They want enough money so they can buy cool shit like a fancy watch or a nice truck or go on vacations to places like this. And then most people never, I shouldn't say most people, but a lot of people go through life and they're continually chasing. So you finally reach some point where you've got the financial side down pat. You've got a handful of successful businesses bringing in money every month. And we don't need to get into the specifics of how much money you make by any means, but you're still doing it. Like you could relax. You could just do jujitsu and crochet. Well, you know, I don't think that my body could handle much more jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'll joke with my dad. I talk to my dad a lot. We have a good relationship and I'll say, oh, I'm just so busy. I got all these things going on and he'll laugh and say, well, if you didn't, you just go open something else and find a way to make yourself busier. You know, I, I spent some time and I think a lot of people, you know, you're saying people want things and I get that, but I think a lot of people have this idea of retirement and you and I've talked about this and we talk about this with a lot of people. I'm going to go, I want to go sit margaritas on the beach. Yeah. That's cool for like a day. Yeah, maybe two. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're drunk and bloated and sunburned. <laughs> right, right, and, right, right. You know, uh, what well, else? Uh, we're like the skunk we just found in the pool. Yeah. Literally just happened. We found a skunk. He found a skunk dead floating in the pool. It did. And not like in the actual pool, in the reservoir on the side. So it's been there a couple of days bloated. We've been smelling it and didn't know where the hell it came from. But, you know, to the point, um, you know, what does retirement look like? What is, you know, I don't. There aren't things that I want that I can't afford. And that doesn't mean, you know, would I like to have a jet? I mean, yeah, I guess, but. Are um, you willing to do what it takes to have yeah, jet no. money? So, I mean, I drive a nice car. I have a nice home. Um, you know, my wife is taken care of. My stepkids, you know, are doing well. You know, I wear my stuff sometimes, usually your stuff, Andy's, somebody else's, mm -hmm. my friend's businesses, <clears throat> you know, not into fancy clothes. I guess I wear fancy flip flops. Toehold. <laughs> you do wear fancy flip flops. <laughs> That's about it. You know, I'm not into super extravagant things. So I, I guess to maybe the point you're making, it's not about money for me. I like building places out. I like creating things. I also like creating jobs and taking people, um, you know, that are motivated and helping them achieve more. I mean, I have people, you know, that work for me, not that money's the end all and be all, but to go from a position where in, you know, 2008, I went probably multiple years without cashing a paycheck to be able to have employees that make six figures and I can get insurance plans for it all that. How did you pay your that. rent? How did I what? How'd you pay the rent? My rent at the time, I was a mortgage. I had a town home, it was $1,200 a month. Uh, I didn't have a car payment, I had a piece of shit car. Um, I would just scrape by enough to be able to pay that stuff. Back then I would bartend occasionally, I would cook, I'd do you know whatever I could to get by. And that went on for a very long time. I mean, I remember you know, having to skip a family Thanksgiving because we were open and we had some catastrophe and, you know, my mom's crying, I'm not going to make it to Thanksgiving and stuff. And her asking me, you know, why don't you just go get a normal job? And it was not meant in malice or anything like that. Just, you know, this seems so hard and I don't think this is going to end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we've talked about it since. And she'll say, you know, it just seemed, you didn't seem happy. You seemed like all you did was work. And I just, I couldn't see the other side of it. And she would say now, clearly you did. So... I did. 
What would you, 40-something Dan, go say to 20-something Dan if you could go sit across from a bar with Buy him? Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, not investment advice. You know, I don't know that I would do things that much differently. And, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of ways to be successful. I know that there is. I see people, you know, do things. The best way and easiest way is just to be born into it, I think. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, in Denver, Silver Spoon. Yeah, Denver, our mutual friend. And he and I have talked about it. The only way I know is what I've done. So that's the only thing I could give, you know, advice or feedback to someone on. And that involved a lot of 100-hour weeks and living at my stores and missing out on a lot of things. I, I would do it over again. I don't regret it. But while other people were out doing a lot of things, I was at my restaurant every day. So kind of the story you hear over and over about, like, grinding it out. Yeah, but it wasn't. You know, there was times and there were, that I was upset and, you know, there's parts about it that sucked, but it's kind of like, I miss some of that too. You know, it, when you look back on it now that you're through it, it's cool to be like, you know, yeah, I worked in the kitchen for eight weeks or seven weeks or whatever it was, open to close seven days a week because we didn't have staff and that's really how I really learned how to cook. Do you think you miss hot grease splashing on you? And No, after like I go back there and help out for like an hour, if we're like insanely busy and I'm in store, I'm like, yeah, this is pretty, I don't, I don't miss this. What, well, what do you miss? What is it? Is, well, it the, the, is it the fight? Well, you think about too, so I was a former distance runner, as you know, I ran in high school and college. You know, I have no desire to go out and race again, run again, but when I think back on working, or not working, running 100 mile weeks, grinding that out, you know, the people I ran with or worked with and the camaraderie and stuff like that was enjoyable. It was fun. It was, you know, there was no certainty. And it's, it was a different mentality, too, because there was no safety net there. It wasn't, you know, now if a bartender calls in sick or something, there's people to back them up. Then there's managers and there's you people from other stores. So. There's all that. Before it was, well... So and so can't come in, so I can either skip my family function or whatever it is and go in, I'm going to work, or we're closing. So a lot of people that are in your position, that's exactly what they do: mom, dad, sister. They work in the place, and then you just see the same people in there grinding it, grinding it, grinding it, working. Well, and that's an interesting thing too. A lot of people in the restaurant business never work, never get out of the store, right? And that was a, a very conscious thing for me about six or seven years ago was okay, now we have some success, we have more than one store, I'm still in store every single day. So I've gradually over you know, years, not over months, backed myself out of working in store to the point now where I pretty much only work what I call on store. So social media, marketing, um, running the construction aspect of things, working on recipes, doing photographs, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not physically in stores managing people or cooking, bartending, touching tables, things mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you lose some of the connection to the customer doing that? If that's what your brand is built on, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly um, people I'm friends with that work in store all the time and they do very well, but if they're not there, then it's, everything kind of crumbles down or where's people Bob, are upset. Where's John? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and you've known me through this time. I was never the guy to come up to your table and ask how Bobby's Little League game was and you know, how your cat is and all that stuff. That was never something I excelled at. Why didn't you change it? If I didn't want to, that's not <laughs> who I am. I don't care about Bobby's fucking little league game or that stupid cat. I mean, provide good service, have good food, hot food hot, cold food cold, that kind of stuff. Offer some value, atmosphere and ambiance. I mean, those are the things I want to compete on, not if, you know, I'm personal friends with every customer. Hot food hot, cold food cold. Kind of like what we were talking about at jujitsu today, just very basic things done over and over again. And you don't have the anomaly. Like we went to a restaurant in town today. There's a, about eight, 10 of us traveling together. And half of us sat inside, half of us sat outside. And all of a sudden you guys came and said after 45 minutes, they lost your check. Yeah. It's kind of like a basic function of a restaurant. Well, it's a broken <laughs> system. So that place takes cash only. Yeah. They don't have a point of sale system, which means they don't have a computer where a waitress either on a tablet or a computer or whatever enters stuff in, it prints a ticket. They're hand doing what's called handwriting tickets. Mickey wants mozzarella wedges and whatever. Well, we had ordered some apps and what I think happened is it was all on one ticket. They stuck it in. 
made the apps, punched the whole ticket, it never got there. So it's multiple broken systems. In my opinion, they're taking cash only because they're Americans running a business down here and they probably aren't paying the proper taxes or doing things. And I think that when I paid that bill, we probably paid for whatever you ordered and never got. No, they, we were on a separate tab. Oh, okay. Uh, but, I mean, it's possible. But, you know, multiple layers of broken systems there. You don't have a point of sale. The idea that you don't take credit cards in this day and age is kind of crazy. Hmm. Um, you know, don't have any systems. I don't know if I'm totally against that, but, I, yeah, it is so expected by the consumer. I mean, I, I always carry cash, not a lot, um, maybe 200 bucks at times, but, you know, I understand as well or better than anybody what it costs to process credit cards, which is also why I use credit cards because I want my points or my right. rebates or, you know, whatever else. I've got a credit card I get 2% cash back on or whatever. So I'll always ask a vendor, even on the restaurants, I'm going to go buy $10,000 in lumber for something. Do you have a cash discount or check discount sure. or whatever? No? Okay, well, I'm going to pay with my credit card. You get the points. When did you start doing jujitsu? Started training jujitsu in 2011, I believe, with Mike Budnick at Triton MMA. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of wandered in, 240 pounds, had just gotten out of a relationship, um, was not doing anything positive or good to my body, and maybe at that time with my life, um, and just kind of got obsessed with it. Mike had three classes a day at that time. I started doing all of them. I ended up competing in MMA at 170 pounds, had three uh, amateur matches before moving on just doing jujitsu, but it was something that I was, I knew that, I shouldn't say I knew, I was always interested in MMA to some extent, seeing it on TV, seeing all that stuff. You know, we grew up around the time the UFC really got big. Yeah. Um, and I was in my 30s, I was born in 1980, so I was 31 when I started. I don't think I ever had any dreams or aspirations, hey, I'm gonna go to the UFC, but I was very interested in it, uh, interested in fighting. And it was something that with a competitive nature and liking to work out and stuff that I just really got into fast. Wanted to try it, yeah. wanted to taste it before you were too old. You did three MMA fights and then you said no, no more? Yeah, well, Mike had relocated down to Florida. Um, our team, you know, prior to that, some guys had left. We didn't really have a full fight team anymore. And then once Mike left, you know, Alex was still around who was working with me on jiu-jitsu at that time. Um, you know, Alex and I decided to open a uh, academy, which is now Alpha BJJ as we know it. Um, so, you know, I, I transferred, yeah, into, into just doing jiu-jitsu and then uh, started to compete in jiu-jitsu tournaments and um, do that and had some success with that. And then more guys and gals started to compete and now we have a, you know, pretty big comp team. What do you think it makes yours any different than anybody else's? I mean, I know. My jiu-jitsu? Yeah, what makes it any different? What makes I don't it know that it's different than, it, different than everybody's. Um, I said it. Yeah, so just like, what, what, what do you do different? What makes yours yours? What makes mine mine? So my jiu-jitsu is all fundamental-based. Um, you know, the idea that strength doesn't matter, doesn't exist in jiu-jitsu, we, if you've done it at all, you know that to be a fallacy, of course. Mm -hmm. But we focus on extremely basic techniques very detailed, we move through our curriculum very slow, as you're fully aware. Mm -hmm. um, you and I have both traveled and trained a lot, and jiu-jitsu is one of those things, you know, same thing when I was a distance runner, a little bit different because as a distance runner, I knew what my mile time was. So you couldn't argue with me if I'm, my mile time is X and yours is X plus three seconds, you're really not gonna argue that you're better than me, that's just, we're there, that's the comparison. That's but. You know, it does exist in jiu-jitsu in terms of the fact that we, if we go train together, we go roll, and you and I travel a lot and get to visit other gyms, and people will say, hey, this style or this thing, you know, is so effective. Cool, show me. You know, I, I want to feel it. Um, I've trained with some phenomenal world-class instructors. My coach, Henry Akins, um, Rob Drysdale, I trained at his school in Vegas a lot, Casey Halstead, all very different styles, but... You know, against those students, those people, you get to test things out, move around. You know, I'm not the best guy in the world. I do think I'm a good instructor. I do believe in the things we're showing. And I think on a competition level, despite the fact that everything I teach is self-defense rooted and oriented, we've been able to, you know, have competitors have some success uh, in competition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When somebody's looking, you and I talk about this a lot because people will see the stuff that we post. People always ask me, well, what do I look for? 
And I think they open the yellow pages up or whatever, not the yellow pages, but they open up the internet nowadays and they, if you see us looking, there's a vulture outside the house here flying around. We're on a hillside, oceans out there. and Probably looking for skunk carcasses. Literally, that vulture is looking for that skunk, yep. It's, it literally just flew three feet from the glass, like a eight foot, seven foot wing turkey vulture. But that's, an, I mean, I get asked all the time, hey, I'm in Destin, Florida. Yeah. Where should I go? Yeah. Well, I don't know what's there. And then, you know, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but say there's XYZ organization. Yeah. Should I go there? I don't know. I'll check out their Facebook, check out their webpage. If I know someone in that organization, hey, what do you know about this school? And I'll have people sometimes in an organization say, ah, I know the guy who owns that place or the head instructor. I'd probably tell your guy to steer somewhere else. Uh, something I say a lot, you know, not all jujitsu is created equal. But even on top of that, you know, there's levels to this and there's people that are amazing instructors and people that are poor instructors and that does not coincide with performance levels. Mm. I've trained with guys that are absolute world-class competitors and seen them try to show techniques and not been able to follow them. I've also learned techniques from people that I'm significantly better than when I roll with them but have so much knowledge um, of technique and understanding of things that maybe they can't execute it strung in with a bunch of other stuff, but they're still an amazing teacher. They've got the ability to articulate it, but. Well, and as we age, right? I mean, I'm 43 right mm -hmm. now. Um, you know, I don't think when I'm 65 that I'm gonna be able to handle our 25 year old blue belts who are, you know, training seven days a week and doing whatever. But that doesn't mean I don't have things to offer them in terms of teaching them what's going on. Sure. That's a hard thing too. We were talking with, uh... I don't want to say names, but one of the guys this weekend, that's our friend that's a little older, and he's like, I don't know if I can do this in five or ten years. And like, what are some thoughts on that longevity? We talk about it constantly. Well, I mean, I think a lot of it comes into your training. Uh, we are known for rolling hard, I would say, from people that visit. What's that mean to people? So that's what I was going to say, yeah. So to them, I, I'm not quite certain. I don't think that we put anybody in danger. I don't think we're not punching, kicking ripping submissions or doing anything but in terms of what separates the jujitsu it's very pressure oriented mm. um so it feels hard well and i'm not going to give you negative feedback you know if you wrap your arm around my neck and i'm not in danger of being rendered unconscious i'm not going to tap mm -hmm. if you put my arm in a position where it just kind of hurts i'm also not going to let you hurt me if and i don't mean you but anybody if someone has my arm, I don't care if they're a brand new white belt and it's compromised and you know, it's gonna break, I'm just gonna tap. Right. But that being said, I'm not just you know, flowing around and doing a kata of jujitsu. Had a guy this morning that did that, tapped where there was no, I wasn't doing anything. And I said, why did you do that? And he was like, oh, you had me. And most definitely, I was just like, okay. Like I didn't, hadn't even done anything to his neck. And I thought, okay, all right, like, I think it was fear, but I would venture to say where he visits every week to train, they probably are letting each other go at some pre-point. Well, you and I have talked about, you know, students that we have at our gym, training partners, where when they first came in, we've had guys where if you just touch their neck, they tap instantly because yeah. they're uncomfortable. And at least one of those guys now, it's like, you know, you have to, similar to you or I, be on the verge of him going unconscious before he's even going to think about tapping. Yeah. It changes. You get seasoned to it. And that, I think, is a testament to if you're training to quit and training to tap early and you're never experiencing, you know, what it is like to go at a higher effort but still safe, I don't know what's going to happen to you if you get in a real confrontation. Mm -hmm. How does somebody, like, become a good training partner, pick a good training partner, identify a good training partner? So, I mean, I think that's gonna depend on what you're comfortable with. You know, hopefully your school provides a safe environment. You know, you don't wanna be the Cobra Kai school, right? Where mm -hmm. Johnny's breaking people's legs or whatever. Uh, Sweep the leg. You know, and there's a lot of weird hero worship stuff in jujitsu I see happen where, you know, someone's a black belt in jujitsu, so that makes them a black belt in finance and stock picking and mm -hmm. everything else. And the internet is filled with stories of people taking advantage of those positions. Being a black belt just means that they trained a lot of jujitsu and they achieved that rank. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Doesn't make them a good person. It's kind of like somebody that uh, came from the place Andy came from. They might be really great at being a SEAL, but 
they might be a shitbag dad. Yeah. Maybe not, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, and that, that's something as I've aged, I've learned with a lot of things. There's people that you hold in a high regard because they have achieved something. And that's not to diminish that achievement, but that does not transfer over into, right. into anything else. Because you got 50 home runs doesn't mean... Well, and I, I saw a clip Andy posted of Evan, the guy from Black Rifle Coffee, talking about on his uh, Instagram, they did some pod, his new podcast together. You know, me being a, a former Green Beret doesn't mean I was going to be successful at business. I could be successful or I could not, and maybe some of those traits carry over, but one does not mean the other. Sure, that's true. Yeah, I think we... We kind of, like you just brought that up, it kind of changed the thought of what we were talking about, but we do easily just look at a musician, a, a sports person, an athlete. Well, there's a reason they say, you know, don't meet your heroes. Yeah. Because you might be disappointed. I've definitely met a few people that I thought were great because of what they did. A musician, a very famous one, and he was a complete asshole. You told I me still that. like him, but... He is a complete asshole, or he was in that moment. I had to try to have mercy. He's an older guy, and hot day, long flight, all that stuff. I can be an asshole too, I'm sure. So when somebody's trying, like this is something I think that's valuable to talk about. Probably the reason I harp on it or think about it so much is I see so many people that are not good training partners. Yeah, so back to that. You know, having a culture within the school where people are helping each other without coaching each other, I think is important. Um, What's that mean? So in our school, you know, we allow people to help each other to do things. If that transfers into where you have lower belts that are full on coaching, teaching techniques while the teacher is teaching or teaching side techniques, that becomes disruptive. Mm -hmm. You know, saying, hey, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'll see you do it. Something will be going on, whether it's a role or in class or whatever. Hey, Dan, so he was doing this. And I was telling him, you know, maybe that's not the greatest thing because of this. Could you put some more detail onto that? Sure. Or whatever. You know, but when someone tries to take it upon themselves to become a coach, um, I don't think that's a positive thing. And it can, it can ultimately end negatively. And all gyms have people that maybe you don't want to roll with. Maybe they're too big and strong and they don't understand that and do that. And certainly you can get into conversations about, well, do you, is there a mat enforcer? And does that person kind of put it on that guy or whatever? And that, that does happen. It does happen in a lot of schools. You know, no school's immune to it. I mean, we have guys that definitely roll harder that we're aware of. Guys like you and I that are fit and good at jujitsu, I think there's nobody that I avoid rolling with. But my wife, who's 120 pounds and a female, but silver medalist at uh, Masters Worlds, purple belt, isn't really afraid of anybody, but there's certain men at our school that she feels are rougher and have significant size on her that mm. she will not seek out for rolling or I will tell them no. Sometimes like that, it's not that the guy's even mean. Maybe he's just like not dainty and can't feel his weight in a certain place. Or... I think more often than not, and certainly in the people that I've known, because I've talked to people, been like, hey man, what are you doing? Like, I just watched you roll with this woman and she's a 120 pound female and you spent the whole round smashing her in side control <laughs> and you know it's one funny. guy told me like well you told me to get on top and stay on top <laughs> well yeah that is what i said so, so you got to get a little more detail yeah. in your instruction so it's a leadership thing it's 100 percent a leadership thing yeah. i mean there are bad students i don't believe you know there are there are no bad students there's only bad teachers there's bad students yeah yeah not everybody's cut out to do dangerous things with other p access to other people's body. Well, and we've had situations too where um, outside of the gym, people have done things that caused me to have to have a conversation that I would no longer train them to be better at violence. Yeah. And, you know, I've had that happen with people that I'm friends with or was friends with. Um, you know, you got arrested for a domestic or something. Well, you don't understand. You weren't there. Absolutely, I was not but you were arrested for hurting a smaller, weaker person, and we're trying to train people to defend themselves against bigger people. <laughs> yeah, so. from doing things like you got arrested for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, it's not a tough one. It's tough when it's a friend or somebody you spend a lot of time with, but you've got to kind of draw a hard line like that. Because... Well, on the outside, it's always easy, right? It's easy to see, like, oh, well, this school let this guy train, and, you know, you see the headlines all over, whatever, Instagram or Facebook of, this person did this and this gym's still letting him train. Well, I don't own those gyms, but I do own my gym and I've got to set standards and 
It just is what it is. Mm. As a, you know, listen to that stuff, you think about it, you see people, you go into different gyms and you can almost see just by watching people. There's a guy today that was with us that just basically stalked around the perimeter of the mats, waiting for tired people that were smaller than him so he could pounce on them, feel good, and then disappear after 20 minutes while these other people are spending an hour drenched in sweat. When it, happen it happens to me as a black belt, I'll watch, you know, I a four stripe purple belt that knows who I am that's at you know a camp like this. Watch me in 100 degree weather roll 10 times while he moves around twice with a white belt and it's like, hey, you wanna roll? And then wants to go super hard, which great, my jujitsu should work when I'm tired and less able to defend myself and it You're did. You're the kind of person that will test it and do it, but yeah, that's kind of a shitty. It is. But kind of a shitty human move. You know, I might be out on a 10 mile run and have a guy try to attack me. So right, you can't if my jujitsu only works when I'm ready, when there's a ref, when there's a rule set, then what good is it? Right. That's, and that's kind of a mindset thing. What's some of your mindset for jujitsu? So like that right there was, I think a good segue into it. Yeah, well, I mean, you need to be able to fight from a disadvantage. You need to be able to fight from every position. Um, you know, we do a ton of positional training in mm -hmm. our gym, which forces people to be in bad positions. Um, What's that mean? So for instance, someone being on your back would mean that I have my legs wrapped around you, I'm trying to choke you from behind. It's a difficult position to get to on someone, and if you're skilled in other areas of jiu-jitsu, um, for instance, at our gym, there's very few, if any, people that could probably get on my back with any sense of regularity if I just refused it. So I could train all the time without anyone ever getting on my back. Then if I go to compete or I get in an actual altercation, where someone's able to obtain my back, now I'm not very well trained to defend that. Whereas at our gym, every single day for our warm-ups, we don't do traditional warm-ups. We don't do somersaults and cartwheels and back rolls and forward rolls and gym class stuff, which most schools do. We do positional training. So we'll do, for instance, on the back, I'm on your back for three minutes attempting to finish you and hold the position you're trying to escape. Bell goes off, we switch positions. We do the same. We do the same with takedowns, which is a big area I feel people lack in in jiu-jitsu. I think I personally lack in that position. Um, I didn't start really developing that till brown belt. And a variety of other positions, four or five positions in the warm-up. I teach class, four or five positions after. Then we go on to live rolls. What's the belts mean? Like so, to you, because uh, you could go on the uh, internet and read 98 million things. So for me, the, the belt that means something the most is the blue belt to me. If you're training after blue belt, you're training because you enjoy what you're doing. That's interesting, everybody's always like, white belt's the most important, you showed up. Yeah, you showed up, okay. I mean, I don't think that's that hard. I don't need to, I mean, people make memes about all this stuff, like, you outrank everybody on the couch. I mean, probably that's not really true. <laughs> there are a lot of guys on the couch that can still beat your ass. That's true, yeah, um, I know some of those guys. Yeah, but at, at the blue belt level, for me, when I give someone a blue belt, they can defend themselves against an attacker. They know basic self-defense. Um, someone that's training three or four days a week at our academy, two, two and a half years is about when we would consider, you know, if they're on a normal progression and they're super consistent, that they would get that belt. And after that, you know, they can execute most of the moves. Our curriculum's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. After that, you're just polishing. I'm not really, someone who's a blue belt to a purple belt, the purple belt doesn't know more moves, they actually, if anything, probably do less moves. They start removing things from their game. Not that they'll never do them, but they start developing kind of their A game and doing that stuff. But after Blue Belt, you love jujitsu. Um, you love what you're doing. You like your training partners. You like the academy. You like the lifestyle, the things that come along with it, as I do. Um, you know, you've obviously been a Blue Belt for almost two years. You clearly enjoy it. Derek, Katie, Andy, all the people we're with are, are fall into that boat. But if you're looking to defend yourself against most attackers, the average attacker, yeah, with blue belt, you're probably there. Now, let's shift that. I'm sitting on a bar, I've had four or five cocktails, some guy punches me from behind, maybe that punch ends the fight and I'm knocked unconscious and that's yeah. it. Maybe I'm dazed and I'm on my back, how well can I defend myself then? Now there starts being, well, maybe I'm not fighting at a black belt level anymore, but I'm able to remember things and have reflexes that are able for me to defend myself. Don't drink on bar stools. Well, Go home stand and up? sit in your basement like a man. And cry? And cry alone in the dark. The... I don't have a finished basement. Oh, uh, it's even better. You just sit like in a damp, 
damp corner. Go hang out with the dead skunk out there. <laughs> so your point is, is that at a higher level when diminished, maybe not from alcohol, maybe because you got your head rocked. From whatever, car accident, yeah. got anything happen. That you can dig from a deeper level. But then also on the flip side, let's be realistic, you know, jujitsu is not the ultimate self-defense. Um, first off, avoid getting in confrontations. We've yeah. talked a lot about that extensively and probably on other podcasts. You know, situational awareness is more important than anything. Yeah. Inside of a certain range, I think jujitsu can be extremely effective. But if you don't know takedowns, if you don't know how to clinch people, how to get them away from you, if you don't have some type of uh, answers for weapons, and not, I'm not talking about disarming people that, in my mind, I'm not going to say it's a myth, but... You know, somebody pulls out a knife and I don't have a knife, or even if I do and we're fighting, I'm getting cut. Yeah. That's just what's happening. Um, but let's assume we're just using our hands for this fight. You know, jiu-jitsu is definitely a tool, but it's a single tool. I mean, if you're really looking to be the whole package, do firearms training, learn some, you know, knife defense, different stuff. You know, we've worked with guys like Todd Fox and Instructor Z and mm -hmm. Paul Sharp to try to mm -hmm. better those skills for ourselves. And admittedly, my exposure to you know, the gun retention and some of that stuff is, you know, minuscule compared to my jiu-jitsu training. But I don't think because I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu, that means that I can fully retain my firearm or stop someone else from administering theirs. At any time, right? Yeah. You're going to do it better than most people. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have trained it. You have But to my point, I mean, I think some people get a blue belt or purple belt or black belt or whatever, and then just suddenly think they're invincible. Yeah. That's definitely not the case. We prove that all the time. Yeah. What comes after the blue belt? Purple belt. So uh, purple belt, two to three years of blue belt normally with very consistent training, we see a purple belt. At that point... Um, you said they do less. Yeah. So that would be the opposite of most well, people's thought, right? First off, they don't do warm-ups. They show up late. <laughs> There's so, an inside joke here, guys. Yeah. Well, it's not really that. Inside to jiu-jitsu, but yeah. you know, they say that purple belts don't do warm-ups. And I myself as purple belt for probably, I don't know, eight months or a year, didn't do class, I'd just show up and roll, which is where we kind of spar, which is retarded. Um, and I did it anyway, but I thought I was a lot better than I was at the time. But when I say they do less, I mean, you really start to develop your own game. At blue belt, I think, especially beginning of blue belt, you have all these techniques and you're not very good at any of them. You know, you're like an average high school student kind of bumming around. You, Learn some chemistry, <laughs> right, learn a little right, bit right. of science, you Got do whatever. Got a C on this, a, yeah. maybe a B plus on that one. And purple belts maybe like, you know, you go to community college, so you're not ready to like fully specialize yet. You couldn't get into well, the university. Maybe you can understand you want to do business yeah. or art or something. Yeah, so you start doing that stuff. And, it, you know, purple belt for me, uh, well, blue belt and into purple belt, I was doing leg locks a lot before they were as big as they are now and certain things, but then that shifted a lot for me. So... Once you get your purple belt, I think you're honing in on your game, you know, finalizing it. And then a brown belt, I think that's where you're really sharpening it. But then also some of the things you took out, you start adding back in. So you start to realize, hey, maybe I'm, you know, I focus so much on leg locks. You know, my guard passing is okay, but I can't pass most other brown belts or black belts guards at will. So now I've got to take these things that maybe I didn't polish up so well, but they're there bring them out of the closet, start focusing on those things. And then a black belt, a lot of people say you start over, and I never really understood that until I was a black belt. And now you think, okay, because in your head, you're getting belts, you're coming up, you're doing these things. If I'm a brown belt and I roll with a black belt, well, I'm supposed to lose. Well, maybe not. And you know, certainly there's times, I mean, you submitted me today, you're a blue belt. So that, that happens all the time. but. At black belt, I think you do kind of start over of, okay, now I'm gonna start, now I'm looking for holes. Now I'm trying to find out what are the weakest parts of my game and how do I work on those? Which kind of requires a wisdom in the game to be able to see the thing. Yeah. And then sometimes maybe you're doing something because it's fun, you wanna work on it. Maybe it's something you need to understand better for your students. Um, I want them to be better at this, so I've gotta be better at it. You know, we talk about we do live takedowns every single uh, class, two, three minute rounds with two different partners. That is not anywhere near the best thing at my game. In fact, we have ex D1 wrestlers that train at our school that are white belts, that when I do rounds with them, I'm getting taken down multiple times. Yeah, division so, one wrestlers. 
Well, but there are some people in any profession or anything or sport that don't want to be exposed like that. So, well, either you're going to sit out and not do that or they're not going to make that part of the curriculum or part of the live training because they don't want to look bad in front of their students. So whereas, a big hole for everybody. Yeah, whereas, you know, Lenny, who you know, um, white belt, XD1 wrestler, high school coach, it's a very successful high school coach. If he's in the room, I'm grabbing him to do takedowns because I can learn from him mm -hmm. and I can get better. I don't care if some new student sees me get taken down a bunch, but it's weird, that little short guy that's 50 pounds lighter than the instructor's blast doubling him across the room. He's also made of concrete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he literally is. That's funny. So the people look at this stuff like you hear people say, I don't want to have the whole conversation where we badmouth other martial arts, but like, oh, my nine-year-old's got a black belt in XYZ, you know, martial art. Doesn't mean the same thing. Doesn't mean, yeah, it does not mean the same thing. A lot of that, um, you know, you'll hear Henry talk about it. I, I don't want to mess up the martial art, but he went to, I think it was Japan for one of Hickson's fights, and they did a demonstration, I believe it was in karate. And the way Henry tells it, they're at the Coliseum or wherever, some big thing. These guys come out, and he said they were, they were doing karate kicks. It wasn't balsa boards. He said they were smashing baseball bats and doing all this stuff, vastly different than anything we're seeing today. And that's probably, we could probably do a whole podcast on anything, jiu-jitsu included now, being watered down to make it more consumable and easier to swallow for yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean I have to kick things and hurt my shins? <laughs> no, thank you. Well, and there's a big discussion now that goes on about, you know, for me, when student retention becomes more important than the martial art to you, mm. you've reached an impasse where now it's a business and it's not a martial art. Mm -hmm. I never want that to happen. I don't think it ever will for us because it's not something I depend on financially. Um, Almost always when I do a seminar, I donate the money somewhere. Uh, my camp that I do down here, when I do it, I donate 100% of the proceeds to Ron and Hero Academy. Which you're the only Academy. one that does that, right? Yeah. Um, and we sell it out every year, and it's done well. And $15,000, $20,000 a year we're able to raise for that, and that's awesome. And I have a great time, and I love it, and it's rewarding to me. And that's, you know, my payment. But shifting back, you know, when you have things like, okay, well, we're not going to let white belts roll. And it's going to take about a year and a half, you know, at XYZ school to get a blue belt. Well, now you're trying to get somebody hooked on to something and learn all these techniques and do this, but they're not really training, but you're getting thousands of dollars from them as a business owner. Yeah. And then when they do get this blue belt and they start doing it, now the rolling in itself is also watered down. Mm -hmm. And so now you're moving people through the ranks and you have people that believe that they can defend themselves and they can't. I tell this story all the time. A girl I knew in college, <coughs> back when Billy Blanks was doing the Tybo oh, yeah, yeah, videos, Tybo. she would do the Tybo videos. And I remember talking to her, and she's like, you know, I kind of feel like a badass doing the Tybo. I'm like, well, I mean, it's like the workout. She's like, yeah, but I mean, I'm doing kicks and punches. I'm like, wait, do you like think that if you were like, something happened, like someone tried to attack you, like you could use you that? You could use the Tybo. And she, no joke, she's like, absolutely. I'm punching, I'm kicking, two and I'm doing... one and two and one and two and one and two. But, you know, no matter what you tell a person, and the point I'm, I'm leading into here is, you know, we get in this, these arguments that I'm not interested in about sport jiu-jitsu versus self-defense and whatever. It doesn't matter how you start a class or what you tell somebody about, hey, this will work really good in a tournament, but you probably shouldn't use it in a bar fight or whatever else. They're going to go out and still believe they can defend themselves and I believe as an instructor of a martial art, if you're not teaching people to defend themselves in a real life situation or you're showing them things that could get them hurt, injured, or killed, you are at least on the moral spectrum liable for that. I agree. We, I feel that same way. Which is why if you're not dr having some non-consensual rolling, the person won't know if the shit works or not. Well, and that's the thing too. How do you know as a white belt if the school you're going into is teaching you the things, I mean, you know, if you go to a, a Krav Maga school, they're going to tell you that they're teaching you the ultimate self-defense and that if they did it hard to you, you would die. And in my experience, that's simply not true. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure some people will comment and tell me how they could kill me if they did Krav Maga on me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a bunch of martial arts that, you know, are completely ineffective. And, you know, I've also had this discussion with a lot of jujitsu guys 
they get in this mindset that, well, we train this superior self-defense-based martial art, and it's all about the art, and all you gotta do is go out and teach it, and people will learn and they'll, they'll flood to you and your gym will be busy. If the efficacy of the martial art for self-defense was the barometer for people signing up, how good it was, whatever else, you wouldn't have these giant taekwondo schools and other things that exist because that stuff's not effective and that's been known for a very long period of time. I mean, yeah. UFC it's one. A, it's effective against completely untrained, unmotivated yeah, combatants. Yeah, and, and I mean, okay, then you get in a discussion, well, something's better than nothing. Maybe, I the, mean, yeah. But why do it? You wanna buy a broken dishwasher or one that works yeah. pretty good? You want a tire that I patched twice or one that's got no yeah. holes in it? Yeah, it's kind of, it is kind of a stupid way of looking at it. Like, eh, like the, the dancing art, I don't want to piss anybody off either, but. Yeah, capoeira. Okay, that one. And like we were talking with the guys and well, it's really cool. Yeah, it's super cool. Like I would love to be good at salsa dancing, but that's not fighting. Well, it, but it was, but. But you're not slaves in captivity anymore. Right, so. right, right. You could actually learn real stuff, but it's cool. And that's cool that you think it's cool, but don't think that it's probably going to, it's not Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. Well, and if you're a jiu-jitsu guy, don't think because you're a jiu-jitsu guy who also has shitty takedowns that you're going to be able to go up against some guy that's even a bar brawler that's throwing huge haymakers if you haven't trained that stuff. Mm -hmm. it's great. He's used to seeing somebody put their head down and run at yeah. him and he just plops. It's great plop. that you're effective once the fight gets to the ground, but if you can't get it to the ground and you're not training takedowns, yeah. you're not training takedowns with people trying to punch you, don't think that some, I mean, that you sound as silly there as someone who's like, yeah, if I get in a fight, I just, you know, see Lose red my and do shit. it. Yeah. If, you're, if you think because you only train jiu-jitsu on the ground with zero takedowns that you can survive in that situation, you sound just as silly. Why do, well, not why do, so these schools, I've been to a handful, three or four, whereas a white belt, maybe like the last one I was at, you had to be a three-stripe white belt to partake in an open mat. And I 100% understand that a person that is new has the ability to hurt somebody or themselves just out of ignorance, not malice or anger or anything, just maybe just, I don't know that if I yank on this thing, I could freaking break this person's yeah. arm. So I don't know what the sweet spot is. I know, um, you know, talking to Leah about how SBG does it with, I think they call it a cap class or something. And they have a series of techniques you have to learn. And then you have to do, it's like two or three rolls with an instructor, black belt or brown belt. And then based on that, they release you kind of into, into the wild. So, Something like that, that makes sense to me. But saying, you know, it depends too. I don't know how long does it take at that gym to get three stripes. I mean, if you're getting three stripes in a month, then, you know, maybe that makes sense. But if it's on the timeline that we're doing things at Alpha, um, you know, you're a year and a half, maybe two years in, um, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, because then that person that whole time is not, like you said, they're, they're drilling a technique that they haven't tested if what they're drilling actually works against somebody who's trying to stop them from doing whatever it is they're trying to do. Well, it's interesting. Someone told me that their family member recently told them that what I was doing was bad because I'm, I'm spreading more violence into the world by teaching jujitsu. And that's an interesting thing to think about. And, you know, I, everyone gets to have their opinion and perspective, even if they're wrong. But from what I have experienced in jujitsu, and being around other martial arts, even boxing, Muay Thai, when I was fighting and what you've seen, most people that are extremely skilled at violence are the least likely people I find to get in confrontations. Yeah, most of us are hugging and grab assing and laughing. And now that doesn't mean that there's not the random guy who's like, I'm just gonna go out and get in bar fights all the time. Those people exist and I know that. Mm -hmm. So it's not, that's an outlier thing. Right, yeah, don't, don't, don't choose that as the argument. Generally speaking, um, you know, someone who is capable of violence is far less willing to execute it because they understand it. Mm -hmm. And they understand somebody else is capable of it too. And they can't, he doesn't, he or she doesn't look a certain way. Well, either. I can tell you when I was, you know, a college distance runner and thought I was pretty tough, I was probably real willing to get in a lot of fights for no reason. Now as a black belt academy owner, competitor, had some MMA fights, whatever, I'm not getting in a fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to have to be a serious situation where I need to defend myself. I'm not willingly going to participate in fighting with someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even something like a busted tooth is not fun. Yeah, $25,000, 20 grand, I don't know. I mean, right, right, are right. expensive. Right, right, right. Let alone jail time and all that. Business. Lawsuits and reputation. You know, yeah, gym owner. And there's plenty of gym owners that are dickheads. That's true, too. That's 
know, that goes to the idea we were talking about, you know, belt not meaning anything. Yeah, there's a lot of gym owners that aren't good people mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, different things. I mean, you've got stuff from one end of the spectrum of, you know, gym owners that are using it as their personal Tinder and dating students, which I, you know, I have huge moral objection to that, to people that are financially taking advantage of people and everything in between. Mm -hmm. But how does somebody, I mean, it's, it's a commitment, right? You're going to sign up at least for a month or two. I think people do introductory classes, but. Well, you don't know anything going in the door, so you don't know what's being taught. If you don't have people that are experienced that train there that can vouch for it, you don't know. Um, and then there's also a proximity and schedule issue. You know, you and I both live very close to the academy we train at. Mm -hmm. If we were to train in an academy that was 45 minutes away, and we do have people that drive an hour to get to Alpha because they want to train with us. And that means the world to me. I think it's awesome. But unless you are super dedicated, and those guys are primarily, some are white belts, I guess, purple belts and up. Um, if you could train four or five days a week at one academy, or you can train once a week at somewhere else, as long as the other academy is not just complete horse shit, you should probably do that because you're going to see yourself get better along those ways. And then you look at like these camps that we do, and you and I have experienced this, people either coming to my camp or Henry's or both, uh, sometimes feel that the jujitsu they're learning after they've got some stripes on their white belt or a blue belt maybe isn't the jujitsu they want to learn. And sometimes that means they end up exploring other options in their area. Mm. And that's okay. Uh, the idea of someone being a creanche or whatever because they left the school, I think that's ridiculous. I mean, we have <clears throat> students to live even in Woodstock one in particular who chose to go to another school um, who was a purple belt because they teach the stuff he wants to learn. He wants to do techniques that are not what I teach, so he's not getting that much better learning stuff for me. That makes sense to me. Yeah, go I'm do not upset at that life. guy. Go do yeah, what you, you want to do. You want to learn that stuff, then you should. I mean, why would you stay with me if you want to if you want to specialize on leg locks? I'm not the guy to teach you that. I can show you straight ankle locks, some basics, and some of the stuff I used to do and still do, but. I'm not the guy that you should be doing that with. Hmm. You know, if you want to learn spider guard, I'm not your guy. But you know a guy. Yeah, no, I do. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's different, and that's the cool thing about the gym, right? We have different people that are really good at different stuff. Yeah. Not everybody is a clone of what I do. Now, there's some things in, like the pressure and side control and, you know, scarf and some of those things that I really specialize in that everybody's pretty capable of, but... You know, we have guys that are into different stuff, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. You triggered my memory. So you said something a minute ago, kind of what you just said brought it up, talking about being adult enough to say that this guy wants to go learn something else. You're not mad about it. You might look and say, I think what we're doing is better, but I understand your life. Go do it. So a minute ago, you said something about, it was really about, personal accountability. You said, I'm not afraid of my students seeing me get taken down over and over again by this guy. I and mean, in fact, if they're, if they're being smart, they'll say, oh, he's doing the right thing. He's subjecting himself to a situation where he's going to grow and learn. Were you always accountable like that? No, or, absolutely you know? not. So in jujitsu, maybe, but not in life. Um, something we talked about earlier this week was the idea, and we were talking about people we know in business of being open to being wrong. Mm. And, um, Somebody told me a story about Eddie Bravo one time, who's the founder of the 10th Planet System, and they talked about he went and trained with his coach, Jean-Jacques, and it was something about a back take or something. He came back and said, hey, we've been doing this wrong or been doing this less efficiently. I got this new way. It's way better. I was wrong about this. We're going to go over here and do it this way. And so people are asking him, like, well, you told us this was the way. He's like, yeah, I was wrong. And that's Period. A, yeah, like that's just it. I was wrong. So being open to being wrong and being open to learning in any business, any martial art, I think is absolutely paramount. If there's a better, more efficient way to do things, I mean, the way that I approach jujitsu is the same way that I approach business. I am looking to get the same or better results with less effort. So, you know, being a black belt in the gym, how do you get better rolling with blue belts? Or, and we have other black belts, but how does someone get better doing that stuff? Well, if I know I can take you down, pass your guard, mount you and submit you, how do I do it in less time, with less effort, with less steps? How do we continue to refine that? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes I think people hear that and they think less work. No, it's not and less that's, work. And that's, the, that's like the, 
the tipping point or the the maybe the fine edge of that discussion because we think yeah I want to do less man I want to do less and it's talk about that well it's all it's doing more and you're going down these huge rabbit holes of perfecting like a guard pass and working on different stuff and to bring it into you know like I work a lot in the hospitality industry we talked about so not falling in love with your own ideas or concepts one idea that comes to my mind is I love prime rib. <clears throat> we live in an area in the Midwest where prime rib's pretty popular. So in my head, hey, let's serve a kick-ass prime rib. It's only offered on Saturday nights. Here's how we're gonna do it, whatever we do it. We do it for a while. It doesn't work. We're not making money, we're throwing stuff out, we're selling prime rib sandwiches on Sunday. Okay, kill it. I was wrong, it didn't work. Instead of, well, the servers aren't explaining it right, or the cooks aren't cooking it right, or the product's not right, or this, I was wrong. It doesn't fit our concept. You think of DC cobs, you don't think of prime rib, we're gonna kill it. Now that's just getting rid of something in terms of like a jujitsu thing, you know, focusing on say takedowns, for example, which is not something I'm great at. You know, okay, I'm gonna get taken down by Lenny all the time, by Derek all the time. I'm gonna take, when we first started really focusing a few years ago on takedowns, I was not in the top 50%, probably not in the top 80% of the room for takedowns. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something I drilled extensively coming up. Um, in competition, most of the guys I go against pull guard, so the efficacy of it there is really not necessarily needed. I recognize, my coach of course recognized for me also, hey, this is a huge hole in your game, you need to focus on it. So I'm gonna get beat up by everybody until I don't. It's just like training jujitsu. you walk in the room as a white belt, you're the worst guy there most likely. Now a new guy signs up and you start getting better and Billy's not training as much and whatever and you start getting better and better and better. And that's an important thing to talk about too. I'm not worried about where I stand against everybody in the room. I'm worried about where I stand against Dan last week, last month, last year, mm. three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And as a 43 year old guy, I can say with absolute confidence that whatever age was my peak, peak in physical performance, I can beat that guy up unequivocally. You wouldn't beat him in a foot race probably. No. You might not beat him in uh Dating game. Yeah, he had less gray hair. <laughs> but but in, in a fight, you'd beat him. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Henry talked about that uh, in regard to Hickson and him being in his mid or late 50s or 40s and saying, you know, I would destroy 25-year-old Hickson. And that's really saying something because you can't really do that. You see, like, these old boxers like uh, Roy Jones Jr. you just saw fight yeah. or uh, Tyson did it, Evander Holyfield did it, George Foreman did it. Uh, who fought um, McGregor, uh, uh, Mayweather. Mayweather. But like, so that was part of my conscious decision to get just into jujitsu was I can do this the rest of my life. Yeah. I'm not gonna get tie kicked in the head the rest of my life. Yeah, you can't. And I wasn't very good at stand up, so I did get kicked in the head a lot. Like uh, the greatest running back of all time couldn't be 50 years old and go run out on the field at even a, probably a college game, he might, do okay but well, and that's one of many reasons i don't race anymore don't run anymore is and i, I have friends that do or ex-teammates i think it's awesome and good for them for me despite what i believe i have a lot of mental strengths in i don't want to go out every year and get slower you because just don't want to feel it or see it it's not entertaining to me either like i like to have goals and you know be able to accomplish things and learn things and running is not as much of a learning thing it's a pure grind um but seeing myself age through that is just not something I'm interested in. And I never actually enjoyed running. Like going out for a jog or doing whatever is not enjoyable for me. I like to race, I like to be competitive, and I really don't like to lose. So that allowed me to be able to do all the training because I'm looking for race day. Let me tell you how much this asshole likes to race. So yesterday, there's four of us in the swimming pool. A very casual um, race, no hands, walking through the pool. And he's like, oh, we're having a race? So he gets involved, and yeah, he won, but and you were quite happy about it. It was funny. It was funny. It was funny. By the way, I swam one underwater lap today. Good. I thought I was going to die. In, because there's a dead skunk in the pool. <laughs> that's true. No, but you are very competitive, and that's, you know, that's not in everybody's nature. I'm not super competitive about a lot of things. I get competitive with myself. Like, I don't want to quit because something's hard or I'm tired. I don't so much care about, like, um, I, I guess everybody's competitive about a lot of things, but my nature is not the same as yours, and I can see that. Well, and, and being competitive and not quitting are different. 
I think both are important in their own their own right. But I think when you start quitting at things, quitting on yourself, quitting on your job, quitting on other people, not being reliable, it starts to spread everywhere. Yeah, it's like like roots. So you were talking about really uh, accountability is really what I was hearing earlier as you were talking about being open enough to say, okay, I'm right or wrong. Or When you talk about accountability, right, you're familiar. It's happened to me twice, unfortunately, but recently, you know, we were going out for the Pan Am Championships. I logged in, changed my weight class. I wasn't planning on doing pans because I'd gotten a stem cell treatment, so I hadn't been training as much. I had to take some time off. I said, hey, I am feeling pretty good. I'm going to do it. I'll just move up a weight class. Boom, done. We had uh, people in town on the weekend of the, um, where you could actually as a professor log in and change stuff. I didn't check it. I didn't change my weight class or didn't take whatever it is, my fault. So now I'm in a situation where, okay, I compete on Thursday or Friday. I've got four days from the time I weighed myself. I've got to lose a little over 20 pounds in order to make weight. It's pretty easy to rationalize and say, no, oh, it's not that big a deal. I wasn't planning on competing anyway. I'll just not compete. I screwed up my entry. But to me, being accountable to myself and to be accountable to my students and friends, I've got to make the weight. So I do all the things to make the weight, made weight, competed, didn't do great, but it was important to me to be accountable in that moment because I, I hold other people accountable. And just like we're talking about whether it's kicking people out of the gym or whatever, I can't expect other people to hold a standard that I'm unwilling to hold myself. You could have made an excuse and said the website thing didn't take, blah, blah, blah. How many pounds did you lose? 20 something. Low In how days, long? Four days. Ugh. Not enjoyable, not healthy. I don't recommend you do it. And if it did happen with a student, I would not allow them to cut the weight, but I would be very upset with them for not being accountable and rechecking to me. I mean, I should have, and I had the responsibility. Okay, I changed it. I should have logged back on to make sure that it took. That's my responsibility. And also, as an instructor, I should have. And I did look at other people's weight classes to make, because we had a couple people that were thinking, you know, this class or that. I text them, hey, do you want me to change it? Are you good? I didn't check my own. So many lessons in that. And we get busy, too. You, you got, and this is where excuses are easily easy to be made. I'm juggling so many things. I'm traveling out of the country. I'm traveling here. I'm traveling there. I got this going on with the family, this with the kids. I just bought this new thing. And it's, those are all choices, though. Yeah. That's, I think that's kind of what I was driving towards, and it becomes those tendrils or those, kind of like, what were those trees called when we went in the jungle the other day? There was the one he pointed out to us that chokes the other trees. Yeah. Was it called a strangler? Yeah, something. A strangler tree? Yeah. Huge, huge trees in the rainforest, and they were basically vines, but they, like, wrapped around the whole tree and basically, like, crunched it and strangled it and killed these they said eventually they'll grow all the way around it and it'll rot the tree totally out. Yeah, it was cool. There were some held up, these trees that were freaking this wide, all dead, but held up by those vines. It was amazing. Yeah. Same thing. That's kind of what it made me think of as we were talking. And you just let it, you just let this shit keep growing. You can hear that. You see people. We know a guy. We know a couple guys, but I know who you know who I'm talking about, that they are chronic they just spew these vines out of their mouth. Every yeah. time you see them, you're just like, fuck off. I don't even nothing's, know listen Nothing's to ever your fault. And, you know, I think both of us are willing to help anybody that wants to be helped. You know, someone says, hey, I'm having a really hard time getting in here. I want to commit. So, I, you know, I've had conversations with guys. Hey, I, you know, I'm going to start texting you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to do whatever. We're going to want you to get in X amount of times a week. What do you think you can do? Whatever. And I'm happy to help. And some people have had really good success with it. Other people fall off and don't make it. And that's yeah. okay. I can't do it for somebody. It's not for everybody. I say that all the time. It's just not for everybody. Um, you know, that's one of like the, these other taglines, like being ahead of everybody is a white belt. You know, you're, it's not for everybody, but it could be. Jiu-Jitsu, the other thing that, you know, I, I said in a recent post, Jiu-Jitsu doesn't change for you. You change for Jiu-Jitsu. Hmm. So if you're unwilling to deal with what it takes to level up what it takes to get better, which means blood and sweat and all this other stuff. We're not playing checkers. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna come out there and like get effective. loose today. Yeah, get effective <laughs> at jujitsu yeah. without some pain, without yeah. some bleeding, without some sweat, without a lot of other stuff. And I believe the rewards far outweigh those things that you have to sacrifice for it. But, you know, you're gonna miss out on some other stuff if you wanna do it. Doesn't mean you need to be there seven days a week like I am, but you know, if you're gonna commit to being there three or four days a week, 
there's some other stuff you're not going to be able to do. There's only so much time in the day. But if you're also saying, well, I can't afford it or I don't have time to do it, that could be true. There yeah. are people, and I've, I've talked to people where I've, I've told students who were paying, hey, you've talked to me about this stuff. Maybe you need to take a little break, focus on figuring out these things in your life. Maybe it's not time for you to have an extracurricular activity that you put this much time into, you know, if you need to be worried about paying rent and mm -hmm. getting this other you stuff. Yeah, my kids were young. I had to pull away from it. I started it 20 some odd years ago and couldn't afford it. Then had little league and soccer and all that kind of business going on and just well, didn't have the... Generally speaking, not all the time. Again, there's outliers, but people are generally in the positions they're in in life after a certain point for a reason. And you start to see who's making excuses and who some stuff's never their fault or mm -hmm. there's always some external factor of why they couldn't, shouldn't, or why they did do something. And this is really, you know, what I wanted to talk about with folks today because, so people can have you come to their gym, yep. right? You can come, go to their gym, do a seminar, but it's not just learning the techniques of choking somebody or twisting their arm off. It's kind of the stuff that we're talking about and you don't, you know, you're not going to get that in four hours of hanging out, but you build these relationships and you start absorbing the traits of the people around you, which there are hundreds of great jujitsu people that travel around just like what I do and do seminars. But what they're taking is all the stuff that we're talking about. So how does somebody get you to... Yeah, so I, I do seminars on camps. So for seminars, um, danhartjujitsu.com. There's a form on there you can fill out. I do private lessons, not very many. It's not something I'd like to do. I don't accept all private lessons, uh, but you can fill out a request for that if you're in our area and would like to train with me. If somebody wants to book me for a seminar, they can message on there. Otherwise, Dan underscore T underscore Hart, H-A-R-T is my Instagram handle. You can direct message me on that. I can, if it's driving distance drive, flying, I can fly out, do a one or two day seminar, normally a Saturday or Sunday. If you're just looking to train with me, um, I have camps that I do. So Leah Stumpf and I are doing a camp in Ireland coming up. I know you're attending. So mm -hmm. uh, Pilgrim Jiu Jitsu, if you Google that or look on my Instagram or website, you can find the link. That's the end of September, beginning yep. of October. September 28th, October 5th will be in Ireland. So. 2023, in case you're watching this in the future. Yeah, so we'll be training out there, having a great time, staying together, doing a bunch of stuff. Then we are back down here in Costa Rica in December, I believe November 28th. To December 5th, I believe are the dates. I don't have it in front of me. That sounds right. Yeah, herobjj.com or again, any of my links, you can book that on. That is 100% charity camp where I'm donating all the money. Um, I am looking to do more uh, weekend type seminars in the United States. So if you are an instructor or academy owner, hit me up directly. If you're a student, talk to your professor, school owner, whatever, have them message me and I'd love to come out. You do some consulting stuff with the business side of things for people. Yeah, of course. So, you know, um, business consulting, everything from restaurants, you know, academies, anything else. I own a gi company also, so. Yeah, talk about that. I love my favorite ones. Yeah, so I'll help people with, uh, you know, branding their stuff, social media advertising, all that. But we make uh, Wanderlust travel gis, my wife and I. So when I first started training a bunch, anywhere, not when I first started, that's not true. I was a purple belt at the time, but when I started traveling more, I'm always dropping in gyms when we're going places. So I normally bring a gi, maybe two gis. Gis, when you fold them up, are pretty cumbersome. I don't like to check luggage ever. So my wife starts training. This is my <coughs> girlfriend at the time, soon after fiance. So now we're bringing more gis. Well, now she wants to check bags. Well, somebody's got to make a lightweight travel gi. So start searching it. There's like one option. I found a company out of Hawaii that made some, but they're like sold out and on back order and indefinitely. So I went down the rabbit hole of manufacturing and I have a friend, Scott Nelson, who works in the gi manufacturing space, Lucky Gi, OTM, a bunch of other successful brands. He helps me. We start manufacturing super lightweight, super fast drying travel gis where you can take one, roll it up, put it in your backpack, still have tons of room for luggage. It's cool. And uh, yeah, it works awesome. And we sell those, wanderlustgee.com. Ridiculously durable. I've got one that's got to be three years old. Yeah, I beat the crap out of them. The one I wore this week is a blue one, which is one of our first generation ones. It's got to be five years old. Yeah, and I wear them all the time too. So it's, I mean, you could own something for a long time, but I walk, walk, wear them and wash them cra like crazy. So it's not why I had him tell you all that. He won't tell you that stuff unless prompted to, but it, having him come to a seminar isn't just the techniques. You got a, a lot of access to cool stuff. And you're one of Henry's black belts. Yeah, Henry Aiken's black belt. So I'm a uh, first degree black belt currently in 2023. 
I got my What's black. What's that mean? It means I was active for three years as a black belt. The first three stripes are every three years, so I got my black belt January 1st of 2020. Luckily, easy date to remember because we were in Thailand for one of Henry's camps at a New Year's party. Next day, we're training. Henry awarded me my black belt, which was awesome. And uh, three years later, at a seminar in Montana, we were out visiting our friends who uh, opened a Black Rifle coffee shop, Denver and Andy. Henry did a seminar out there, promoted me to my first stripe. So as of this recording, Henry has four black belts, I believe. Um, no longer having an academy, obviously, just doing high-level coaching and website and stuff. He doesn't have a ton of students that are It's pretty cool because he's been doing it a long time. Yeah, we just did uh, some together. I think he said he's been training 28 years. Yeah, not to make this about him, but just because you just predicated who your jiu-jitsu is based on. Talk about him for 30 seconds, 60 seconds. So Henry uh, started training with Hickson Gracie, who is kind of one of the, if you're watching this and you understand jiu-jitsu, you know who Hickson is. Henry was the third American black belt under Hickson Gracie. He ran the Hickson Academy as the head instructor for something like eight to 10 years at the end of the duration of that. And then was a partner in Dynamics where they had a bunch of UFC fighters before he moved to Vegas and now travels out of there to do seminars, things like that. So, you know, Henry is uh, all over the world teaching seminars, camps. You guys can look those up too, hiddenjujitsu.com, my coach, um, which is why we're here now at his camp. Mm -hmm. So It's good stuff. It's a nice lineage of, of people and now you're passing it on and yeah, I think that's, you know, we talked about the different belt systems too. Now I'm still actively working on my jiu-jitsu always, but also trying to give back and teach what I believe to be the most efficient, most effective way. Um, and one of the things when I started competing that I wanted to do was verify that the system of self-defense based jiu-jitsu would also hold up to competition. Hmm. And that's not to say I'm not an adult world champion, I'm not any kind of world champion, but the efficacy of the martial art and the way that we choose to do it and how we do it is still effective against all the new school jujitsu. Mm -hmm. In fact, oftentimes it works pretty well. Yeah, that's my experience. Yeah, not breaking a sweat. I'm just kidding. Parting words. Uh, you know, I don't think jujitsu is for everyone, but I think you should try it. Um, you know, find a school that's local to you, check it out. Everybody does a free trial, they make you sign a waiver, move around, see if you like it. Uh, you know, if you have four schools in your area, try all four schools. Most people do a one month package, you know, you can get a gi, do whatever and check it out. Uh, combat sports, I think is good. Yeah, it's not like 20 years ago, they're everywhere now. Yeah, I mean, we, we joked about earlier this week, um, I remember there was one purple belt that would drop in our academy. I mean, Mike was a black belt, but when I started training at Triton and it was like insane to see this purple belt now, like, you know, we'll have a class and have four black belts in it. This is like Adam at Jeff's place. Yeah, so, you know, I think jujitsu does not make you a better person. Being good at jujitsu does not make you a better person, but it can certainly be a tool in both humbling you, getting the workout you need, being around other people that, if you're at the right gym, are successful. I mean, something you and I talk about a lot is some of the younger men in our gym and people that have had some success in life like us. You know, some of these kids really, look, and I call them kids, but, you know, Young look up man. to us and yeah. we have an opportunity to have a positive effect on their lives, not just in jujitsu, but in the things they're doing. And they ask us, you know, for advice and different stuff. And it's cool to be a part of that. Yeah, we take that stuff seriously. A couple of the guys and I were talking about that at the gym yesterday. That's probably, besides this art that we're practicing, that's by far one of the greater benefits. Yes. Yeah. Kind of to your point earlier, there are more benefits beyond the martial skill. Yeah, and you know, I don't run anymore. I don't want to go play tennis. I sure as hell don't want to play golf. Um, staying active, doing something that is gonna, you know, if, if you want to do something to work out, I mean, okay, you want to lift weights or do whatever, that's fine. We're moving around people, moving around ourselves, considered a body weight exercise. You're getting harder to kill, more effective at stopping yourself from being attacked, having fun, meeting new people. There's not much downside. Yeah, it's awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation here from Costa Rica, looking at our balls for the last hour and some odd minutes. If you want more information, he gave you the websites. You guys know how to find me, carrytrainer.com, Drew behind the editing desk. Leave a comment. What'd you think of the conversation? Share it if you dug it. Don't be dickheads. Visit our website, carrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., 
Carrie Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com. Said I got me some gunfire gun law. Gunfire gun law, baby. Gunfire gun law. No more gunfire blue. Made in the USA. Amazing lubricity. A hundred percent synthetic, baby. So it's gonna last you longer. So go on carrytrainer.com and order yourself some gunfighter gun or gunfighter lube to get rid of your gunfighter gunfighter blues. I said go on and order yourself some gunfighter gunfighter lube.